Bitch, let me tell you something. your girl Deja Diva and you are tuned in live to the hashtag Diva Gang Podcast where we talk about art, music, entertainment, pop culture and have cultivated controversial conversations. Now let's get into it. Ah, so basically, I'm going to just keep it 100% with you guys. I, uh, I have finally figured out how to set up my camera, how to do it. I was just going to do it on YouTube live and that just wasn't working. So I finally found a method that I think I'd like to be able to do this podcast. I am very excited. Hopefully this comes out better quality than the last one. And hopefully it just keeps getting better and better and better. I'm going to get, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to be getting more lighting in here. This backdrop will be completely different. I just really want this to be like a really, really upscale type situation. But you guys... I know that this episode is a little bit late, but I have tried to not tie myself down to a date date. That's why I posted like approximate on my story, but I will be making flyers soon. We will be sticking to a date. I just have been so focused on my music and a whole lot of other stuff that I haven't been able to have any time to figure out when my availability is going to be best so I can keep these consistently rolled out. I also, this week has just been the week of car trouble. Like, my car stopped in the side of the freeway. And I was so, so scared. I was running low on gas. And I think I ran out of gas and my battery went out. So... It was just crazy. I had to get a new battery. My headlight blew out. They said it was going to cost $1,000 to fix. I said, y'all can shove that thousand up your ass a thousand times. Because I am, I said, fuck it. I'm not getting it fixed. I don't, I don't ever want to spend that amount of money to get a headlight fixed. That's like alternator money. That's starter money. Hell no. That's a super de duper hell no. So I was like, whatever. I could actually use a thousand dollars to put down a down payment and get a whole new damn car. So I, that headlight just gonna be a broke motherfucker at this point. But you guys, I am so excited to be back. I wanted to talk about a whole lot of topics, but we'll start off on the docket with the first topic. And the first topic, we're just gonna go ahead and dive into it. All the dicks on Twitter and Instagram and the worldwide Beyonce's internet. I don't know what's been going on for the past couple weeks, but it just seems like there's a new dick on my timeline. I'm trying to figure out what the hell is going on. I really, let me tell you something. I don't believe, not since Kim Kardashian, can't you believe I said her name on my podcast, but we gonna digress. I do not believe for one second that sex tapes are leaked ever. I don't. I'm sorry. It is 2022. You know how technology works just like I do. You know, I I just, you can accidentally send it to the wrong person, but accidentally posting it on Instagram? No. Like, I don't need, I wouldn't even use Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or whatever. I wouldn't even use any of those apps to try to send some scandalous shit because those apps, you could be logged on to multiple devices. You got, if you're a celebrity, you probably have a publicist or somebody who has control over your public platform. It's just, I wouldn't be sending no dick pics or no puss pics on Instagram either way because I don't need nobody screenshotting, if, especially a blue check. I just don't believe that it was an accident. And lo and behold, Nelly dropped a dick pic, dick video on Instagram story. And you know what's crazy on Instagram story? If I say the word COVID or vaccine or anything like, or if I, I like there was this girl who did like a, a impo- like, like a implied nude shoot. It wasn't nude, but she posted it on her page page and I just reposted it on my story and they said we can't post this because of nudity and I'm just sitting here like 
I didn't post this like and this is not nudity and it's already on her page like y'all didn't take it down on her page but you're taking it down off my story right the community guidelines the new ones at least are really trash on all of these apps that's why I'm really not on TikTok anymore like that but I'm just knowing that anytime I post anything even remotely scandalous, Instagram is putting a flag on the play. But he gets to post a whole porno on his story, and it's cool. Now, maybe they took it down, but they take my shit down immediately. His shit was up long enough for somebody to screen grab it, just a random motherfucker. You don't know how long it took for them to come across his story, to screen grab it, and then post it on Twitter. I don't understand how that works. I, I just... Everybody else shit will get deleted, de taken down, disabled, but for him, it just, I don't know. Nobody accidentally drops a sex tape or a sex video or whatever, especially these niggas with platforms. That's not accidentally happening. Usually they dropping them to promote something or some attention or some buzz. It's a very, very tactical thing that a lot of it, um, celebrities and public figures do in order to sell something like um tiger got like had his whole penis on the internet what something happened with his penis and he dropped the only fans nelly he dropped his dick pic and guess what's coming back to bet real husbands of hollywood so he is just i always know that when people with celebrities drop like nude pictures or sex tapes or whatever it's always something it's a it's a it's a attention grabbing tactic so that they can sell something and we all bought it but i don't think that he thought that he was gonna get the report of his dick that he got off the internet and that's a whole nother story i'll do a whole diva discussion about that because i'm not about to talk about that on my platform um but all press is good press and i guess it i guess it's working hopefully y'all tune in to real husbands of hollywood because that's exactly what he did it for next moving on and I legit legitimately like I was like man I don't know if I should talk about this I don't know I'm feeling some type of way I don't want to ruffle anybody feathers but we're gonna have to go ahead and talk about it do we have a problem by Nicki Minaj and little baby I have thoughts I have opinions if you was on my Instagram story when it first came out you know I have thoughts and opinions um here's my whole thing <laughs> I love Nicki Minaj. Always have been a big Nicki stan. I have been a Nicki stan since before. I like when she was rapping on the staircase with a stack of money. That's how long I've been a fan of Nicki Minaj. When she was sitting on a fence in a park in New York rapping. Shouting out her MySpace page with the curved nails and the in the in the coily hair and the Chinese bang. That's how long I have been a Nikki Stan. Keys under palm trees type Stan. Two sticks in my bun type Stan. And I say all of that to really really say. I am so disappointed in her behavior as of the past maybe four or five years. At first I understood. At first I felt like people were just not looking at it in a nuanced way, you know. But I have a, do we have a problem? Your husband is the person I have a problem with. And you, and you low-key supporting him. But that's a conversation for a whole nother day. I've already spoken about that. But I could not listen to the song or be like a new consumer of your new stuff without that being on my brain. And I, I guess, I, call me a Debbie Downer, call me a hater, a not a real Barb. I feel like I can love somebody and hold somebody accountable at the same time. And that's the problem with a lot of us. And let me just get into this a little bit especially in our communities. We have to understand that 
Blind loyalty does not equal love. It does not equal anything positive for anybody. Blind loyalty is destruction to yourself and the person you're loyal to. I don't, like, my mama has done some shit that I don't fuck with. And I was just like, okay, alrighty, that ain't cool. I love my mother from life to the afterlife. I love my mother more than anybody on this planet. But if I could tell my mama something, I could tell somebody I ain't never met who ain't never met me who don't know I exist something. Period. A lot of y'all do not hold people to task and people just do whatever the fuck they want to do to you because they know you love them, they know you support them, they know... And that's how a lot of celebrities and powerful figures get away with abusing their authority. Because you like them so much, you think they can sing and dance, they pretty and they cool, they cute and they cutesy wootsy and you could and you just let them do whatever the fuck they want. That's how so many of the predators in the industry or the people who be stealing from the artists and all of them, that's how they become so big and they don't get held accountable until 30, 40, 50,000 years later. You can't, I can say I like Nicki Minaj because I like a lot of these people. I think R. Kelly is one of the, I think he is on the top five of best R&B vocalists of all time. Top artists of all time. However, he's a fucking predator. I can say both. Two things can be true at once. And I will keep saying that till I'm blue in the face. I feel like I have said that on almost every podcast I've shot. Two things can be true at once. Two things can be false at once. It's not like, you know what I'm saying? But regardless of that, I did listen to the song. And I'm not going to talk about the song until I get that out. So you can, see, you can suck my dick if you have a problem with me talking about that. I listened to the song. And before I get into the song again, it's going to be some more shit that I'm talking. This is not, this is not no soft po podcast. It's controversial conversations. For real. My, lo my slogan is for real. It's controversial conversations for real. I'm not, I didn't, I don't just say that. This is not no lollipop ass podcast. We get down dirty and real. My issue is I didn't think her comeback needed any male cosign. Especially not somebody who was not in your class. Love, little baby. There's no diss to you. I do believe that you were necessary for the song. But I'm going to talk about that after I get through this part. Because I broke broke this shit down. Like I said on my last podcast about Tasha K. I I actually know what the, I say what the fuck. I, I prepare my shit. I don't just get on here and pop my mouth. But every time you've had a major comeback, it's always had to be on the side of a male cosign. You did not need anybody, actually, but if you were going to get somebody, I don't understand why you didn't get somebody who was in your class. You, But the thing is, for you, Nikki, and this was with all love, because I do love you. I do, I do think you're really talented, and I do think that you do not get a lot of the your, 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 your tens that you need. Y'all not y'all gonna hear all the other shit, but not that part. So I digress. When you did the song with Bia, you did a live and you said that you don't like working with female hip hop artists because it's always a problem. But here's my thing: you work with these niggas with no issue, no background, no research, no no cautionary tales, no nothing. You don't work with all types of niggas. You don't work with niggas who you help them get to number one on the billboards and then they try to talk shit about you afterwards. You work with niggas who throw you under the bus when there's beef at a Met Gala. Me goes. You work with all kinds of niggas who don't fuck with you, who just want to use you to get a hit. And you don't have no rapport with them. You don't say, I don't work with male uh, rappers because of... Because you've been burnt more times by male rappers than you ever had with female rappers. If we're going to be honest. But you give them a pass, a token, a, a, a free space, a get out of jail free card every time. Because you jump at the opportunity to work with any of these niggas. Even niggas that you're, you are way too qualified to work with. Your standard for working with men in hip hop is tremendously lower than the impossible standard that you have with women.
And with women, it's almost like they gotta kiss your ass in order to work with them. And for these niggas, you don't give a you, they 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 could disrespect you, not give a fuck about you. Don't and you jump at the opportunity gleefully. But my issue is when it comes down to women, you have a whole nother standard. And this whole people used you or whatever. No, y'all used each other. And when you're doing a collab, it's not about using. It's about collaborating. It's about being in a collabor like a collaborator. Nobody is using you for nothing because you got your check. If you did, like, if you, like, you know what I'm saying? And when you did the solid for Trina, let it be a solid and keep it pushing. Like, everybody that you work with, it's been a benefit going both ways. So, I don't understand where this drained feeling is coming from when you're working with women versus these niggas who don't give a fuck about you. All the women that you work with, all I can say is they actually care about you. And all the niggas you work with, most of them didn't give a fuck about you and you just still jumped to work with them. Not saying Little Baby is one of those people because that's not what I'm saying at all because he's not. I actually like little baby um, as a person a lot for real. I just don't understand why you have such a lenience to male rappers versus this impossible thing for female rappers. I'm going to be honest. When it comes down to a lot of shit, it's been both ways. So keep it like I just don't understand that. I don't think you need a little baby for a comeback. Now I do. Let's get into the um, the the uh, my actual feelings about the song. That's my feelings about the choice of collaborating and the choice uh, and my feelings about Nicki at the moment. Now let's get to the song. The song, the beat is crazy. Little baby did a really really decent job. Was I blown away? No. But the song is okay. I like the song. I have been listening to it. I listen to it. It's in the mix. It's in the mix. However, the verses were very okay. They were uh, slightly underwhelming. Um, for a comeback, I just, the, the production of the song is really what's killing it because the bars are cool, but they not like, they're nowhere near where I know you can be. And I'm talking about for do we have a problem and bussing because bussing sound like Fifi to me. But with Fifi, you was actually given bar after bar after bar after bar. And for Little Baby, now he's not a punchline type rapper, but he did what he had to do on Do We Have a Problem. And to be honest, it was a slight outshine. And when I say slight, I do mean a sliver of Little Baby over you. And I think that you are a really, really dope artist. I just think that for a big comeback, a four-year comeback, I think I would have tweaked and made my verses a little bit fuller and had a little bit more punchlines and connected a lot of your metaphors because it was a lot of reaches in, all, in both of these songs. I, I'm not at a bus stop, but my niggas bus back. I just, it wasn't, that wasn't, it was a reach. The, the out back, stay out back. Like I've heard that bar a billion times in battle rap. So that bar wasn't really killing it for me. But... I'm just sitting here listening to the music and the beats are fire. I just, I don't want to like the music just for the beat. Um, I thought the video was really high production. And I think that you've taken a lot of the critiques that a lot of commentators have given you about the production and the differentiation of your videos. However, what I do have to say is that you put a lot of money into a video and I it, the whole video was cringe. Lil Baby is a very laid back, introverted person. He just looked like he didn't belong. Um, the way you were holding the guns, it just was cringe. I felt like some physicality in acting coaching could have helped a lot because Corey did what he had to do. Tommy did what he had to do. It just wasn't I felt like the first scene in the interrogation room was really good. I think you did pretty decent. It was the scene at 
the event where they were doing the auction, I think that the acting and the physicality could have been way less indicating, way stronger. And I feel like it was a lot of money in a video that you guys did not up the actual skill of the people on the video to create. And for me, I feel like there's no point in dumping all that type of money into a production if you're not going to actually take it seriously. It seems like everybody showed up People got scripts, the label wrote a script and sent it to Corey and Tommy, and you and little baby just showed up and kind of improv and just filled in the space because y'all are the star. But I feel like y'all should have done the same amount of prep work, acting and physicality wise and blocking wise that y'all had Corey and Tommy do. That's just my opinion. I don't think it's a bad video. I don't think either one of the songs are bad. They're just very underwhelming to me. Um, I still love Nikki. I think that she's awesome, but I just was underwhelmed. I, um, do we have a problem is really palatable and so is busted. And I feel like those songs are going to be good to like get in the club and it's going to be a really easy digest for being in multiple arenas. So the song is definitely going to be played in multiple spaces. And if I'm not mistaken... It entered the billboard at number two last week. Let me see what's going on with the billboard right now. I should have checked this beforehand. It's still number two. The song is doing amazing. And I have not seen you do those types of numbers in a minute. And I'm actually very happy that the song is doing amazing. Because maybe it'll give you some kickback to work on the other songs or whatever else you have planned. And maybe you'll take any of the commentaries serious and implement it into your next work. And then we can have something else to chew on and it'll be like, oh wow, this is like, cause I just want something, I just wanted something better. I see how it's performing, but that has nothing to do, that does not sway my opinion. Next, I wanted to talk about Monique. Okay, so I saw her interview on T.S. Madison's show. First of all, congrats to T.S. Madison. It's a big, big step up from when we were first seeing her on Gag Order, not Gag, Queen's Court. I love the production value. Everything is beautiful. You look amazing. I love this transition of you being in your professional bag. I love it. It's been happening for a minute, but I truly and honestly love the glow. Monique looked beautiful. The salt and pepper in the front, the curls, the makeup, the out. Gorgeous. And I'm not going to get into the backstory of Tyler Perry, Oprah, and Lee Daniels because we already know what we know. And we know what we know. That's all I'm going to say. But what I am going to say is that is my opinion on everything. I 100% stand behind Monique. And let me tell you why. Because first of all, I'm a dark-skinned, fat black woman. I go through what she's going through on a zero dollar scale. People, I have a lot of training. I have a lot of stuff and that shit don't matter. We're low cut and under bald so bad, so bad. Low bald and undercut, hat, <laughs> so bad. I understand it. But here was my feeling in my position on the Netflix thing. People have, first of all, people, the media groups that have been talking to Monique in the thick of the issue, which was like four or five years ago, when the Netflix boycott thing was happening, people called her on her show just to badger her as opposed to listen to her and exchange healthy dialogue. I didn't appreciate the way that the Breakfast Club conducted with her. I didn't appreciate the way that The View conducted with her, especially with be Goldberg. Especially with what she's going through right now. And she probably wished she had a Monique to be on her side right now. I didn't appreciate the way that Sana G conducted with her. I don't appreciate the way that the media was conducting this conversation with her. Because it wasn't a conversation. It was a girl you need to calm down so before you piss the wrong people off. So you don't, so you can make these people happy again to let you back in type conversation. It was a conversation of you shouldn't, you don't speak up. You need to shut the fuck up because if you shut the fuck up, then we won't have to hear you complain anymore. 
It was the same type of energy that white people was giving us when people were kneeling at the games. It's not about the kneeling. It's not about the flag and the military and disrespect. No, you just don't want to see, you don't want to see the protest. But the protest is supposed to happen in places that are public, that you are dwelling in, so that you are uncomfortable and you understand how detrimental the change needs to be. Oh, we don't want to see it. We, you make it uncomfortable for us. It was very much, shut the fuck up and take these crumbs, you black bitch. That's very much the energy that all the media outputs, outlets have been having with this situation for years. And I don't like it. And it's like people on Twitter was like, now everybody support Monique. No, people have been supporting Monique. Y'all just didn't fucking care or listen. For me, I didn't boycott Netflix personally. And let me explain to you why. First of all, <laughs> I don't pay for my Netflix. Have not paid for my Netflix for the past eight years. So I can't boycott something I never supported. I have been using somebody else's account for years. Have my own profile and everything. And it's lit over here. Shout out. Shout out to my mama. <laughs> but on top of that, here's the reason why. Monique, her issue is not unique. Her issue was very, very... Per pertinent and it was very very important Netflix did lowball her disrespectfully but here's the thing about Netflix and this is probably why Netflix lowballs because they do this they have people who are just grateful for the platform there's so many black LGBTQ plus there's so many black female black independent so many black independent films that are on Netflix that no other distribution service would provide them that type of platform to be on everybody's TV screen. The skinny, all of the mo the African movies on there and series, so many movies and films that are f films, shows, series, documentaries, docuseries, um, high on the hog, all of these different black produced works that literally do not eat if it if it's not for Netflix. Mississippi Damned, which is a really really triggering but good movie. It's so many movies on that platform that are done by independent black creators, black. Producers, black craft services, black makeup artists, costume designers, actors, actresses, casting directors, writers, so many of them, black animators, so many. And I'm saying that all of those black people should not have to fall because of Monique. Her issue was important. However, there's thousands of black people who are depending on residuals from Netflix, which is probably the only place that would give them an opportunity to share their work and get paid. Those people are getting, you got 500K, then people are probably only getting like a couple thousand a month, if that. That's just enough money to pay their rent and their car note and their insurance for them to work a nine to five. Those people do not have to crumble because you got a bad deal. And I know that sounds fucked up, but there's so many women who are more marginalized than Monique that use Monique, that use Netflix to eat consistently. And for me, I don't think boycotting Netflix was the solution. I don't. Boycotts, we're going to talk about, slight caveat, caveat, boycotts are meant to sustain, to, to economically make a protest against a certain institution, company, or entity. And they're supposed to have a start and stop date. And the stop date stops when the demands are met. What were the demands? The demands was the, were the demands for you to get a better offer? Or was the demands for black people to not get, black women to not receive those kinds of offers at all? Because at that point, that finish line is so long that if you boycott Netflix, it's just going to be not, not a boycott, but an overall cancellation. But if it was for you to get a secondary offer, 
then it would have to be a, a, a finish line to that. And if you got a secondary offer, you needed to, we like, we needed to know that you got that offer. And then are we going to boycott Netflix when they do it to another black woman? Because they're going to do it. So it was just no point in that. I feel personally that Monique has a platform. It's not humongous, but she has a big enough platform that's bigger than the average person where she wouldn't need to depend on them. And I hate this a lot. I do. I hate that every time black people, black women, black queer folk need any restitution for their worth, they always have to put on an entrepreneurial hat. However, I feel as if you could have done so much better for yourself had you just done, got a space, a venue, a small space in Baltimore, whatever, sold tickets, got an audience, and did a show on your own, and then distributed it through All Black, through BET, through Kevin Stage Studios, through any other Black-owned platform, or even just on OnlyFans, Patreon, YouTube membership, on Vimeo and have people pay for a 24, 48 hour link. I think that you, or you could have started your own. You could have did it on Laugh Out Loud Network with Kevin Hart. It's so many options that you have that other black female comedians don't have that you could have made 500,000 and then some. And then you wouldn't have to be dependent on Netflix giving you a better offer. I'm not saying that what happened to you was right. I'm just saying that I'm broke. Deja is broke currently. And I am doing my podcast, my music, anything that I've produced, I'm doing it 100% independently with the coins in the bottom of my pocket. And I know that I can't go and audition and do this and do that and just pray and pray and pray and hope that somebody gives me money. I can't. This is my 100% job. I have to make moves and ways for myself because if I'm waiting for somebody to give me a yes, before I'm able to pay my bills, I'm going to be homeless until then. I have to do what I can with what I have and be smart and make moves and be a boss and think outside the box and be creative so I can find a way to let my allow myself to eat without having to depend on a white institution to do so. And for you to have a following that you have and the fans that you have and the ones that you got, the few that you have, because it's not nowhere near a platform of Dave Chappelle or a Chris Rock, I would have used that to my advantage and did something on my fucking own. Me, you talked about Wanda Sykes. Me and Wanda would have been best friends and did a buddy-buddy comedy tour. Sold tickets virtually. Did a small, like a two, three-city tour. Sold tickets for two, three, four, five hundred dollars a piece and rocked that shit. And you would have made more money than Netflix would have ever even thought of. And then you wouldn't have to pay that much in taxes because you are the you are the owner. You write off all your expenses. And for me, I think that when you get to a certain level in life and your career, you lose all creativity. So when there's an inconvenience, you don't know what to do. And I know that's a lot. You have not stopped touring, but I also feel like that was the time for you to take charge. You had all that buzz. People were talking shit about you boycotting Netflix, watching Netflix, give you that. That was the time for you to do like a, a, a 10 or 15 minute set in your living room and charge people $5, $10 a pop for a virtual link. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a hustler. Because back when you was working at Popeye's, you were hustling. And I just don't want you to lose that hustle just because Netflix did you dirty. And another thing that I have to say. Based off of the issue at hand with Tyler Perry and uh, Oprah. She got 50K to do fucking Precious, which is nothing to her. She really did Precious as a solid. Let's keep that straight. And it just blew up unexpectedly. She believed in the project. When you are taking a contract for acting, most studios and production companies have the, the acting and the promotion all in one contract. But she didn't have that because it was a small independent film. They only paid her for the time that she was on set. So she was not contractually obligated to promote the film. People are paid to promote the film, whether it's all in one contract or in two separate contracts. She 
would not have done anybody else's movie for 50k. She wouldn't have did no Steven Spielberg, no other big film for 50k. She did it because she believed in a black brother's vision. And the fact of the matter is she was the movie was so big because of her. And the movie did amazing and it got her to a space where she earned a golden globe. A fucking Oscar. And it was like it, it like nobody expected for her to win this award. And people say that once you win awards, because it's true, once you win these big major awards, your your pay, your the, the price goes up. Yesterday's price is not today's price. But that's always been the case for everybody else except for mostly black people, but mainly black women. When she had the deal at Netflix, let me give you a, a dissection because I did my research. Monique has 12 more acting credits than Dave Chappelle. But she has less acting credits than Chris Rock. Monique had a television sitcom that lasted two more seasons than Dave and one more season than Chris. She has an Oscar, Emmy, and Golden Globe. Both of these people, they, Dave has five Emmys and three Grammys, and Chris Rock has four, uh, two Emmys and two Grammys. But she has one Emmy, one Oscar, and one Golden Globe. Neither one of them have an Oscar or a Glo Golden Globe. We're also going to look at the fact that she has eight stand-up specials. Chris Rock only has one more than her, and Dave Chappelle has way more. Way more than both of them put together, actually. <laughs> So, really, as far as resume, ability to draw in a crowd, they're all neck and neck. Some have, one has more than two, two has more than one. It's really not a big fucking difference. I ain't even bothered to look up the stats for Amy Schumer because, come on now, I'm, I, that's unnecessary work. Because she's going to make the money, but her resume is nowhere near touching anybody's on this list. So, it is fair to say that her offer should have been within the realms of these two. The only person I can see having a one-up on all of them is maybe Dave, because he has so much stand-up, so many stand-up specials, and he has so many Emmys and Grammys. He's the only one washing them in two categories. And Chris had, was a producer of his sitcom, which lasted four seasons. But Monique is the only person. But she's winning She's winning also in the award category. And she's winning in the acting credit category for, you know. So I'm just saying this. Monique has a resume and a pool power for an audience just as much as her two counterparts. Dave should be making 20 whatever million. Chris should be making that much. Amy Schumer, because she bring out a crowd, she should be making her 13 mil. But no fucking way should Moni be making drastically that much lower than the person who should be getting the least, which is Amy. No way. Now, they should have offered Monique something between 15 and 18. 15 and 20. The mean, she should have been in that chunk. Probably a little less than maybe, I think maybe Chris or Dave, but probably a little bit more than one of them too. Because her resume is better than both of them in certain aspects and her resume, and their resume is better than hers in certain aspects. So that's where I'm going with the math. She's been telling her story for years. People have not given a fuck, a singular fuck. And I think it's easy to shit on trash black women. And it's easy to kick black women in the water after they've been screaming for help. And I just don't appreciate it. I really don't want Monique to leave this earth. And I'm not trying to talk about death, but everybody got a day. I don't want her to leave this earth with this type of fucking fucked up support that we've been giving her thus far for the past decade. It ain't it and I don't like it. And because I am a dark skinned fat black woman, 
I know that how we're treating Monique is how they're going to treat me. That's how they're going to treat all the black girls at the schools that are young right now. I know that the apple don't fall too far from the crooked ass tree. And a lot of us, and it was not white people who was giving her hell. No, it was us. It was black men specifically. And my issue with that is when are you going to grow a spine and a backbone? Because if you, if it's easy for you to publicly disrespect, disregard black women, how the fuck do you think the rest of the world, world is going to treat us? It's not okay. It's not okay. And we need, as black men, you niggas need to stop being cowards and taking and just doing stuff for the bag and bending over ass backwards and being the fucking um, Sambo and not standing on shit just to preserve yourself and actually stand up for something that's bigger than you, that's bigger than life, that's bigger than money, that's bigger than material shit and actually show up for the people in your community. Other black men, black queer folk, black women, but whatever. It's not all about money and it's not all about me trying to get to the next level. It's about me getting to the next level and making sure I'm not the last person to be at that level. Cause what the fuck do y'all have to lose? Cause half of y'all got millions of dollars anyways. So you might as well do something that's gonna live past your own life expectancy. Come on now. But I digress. The next thing I wanted to talk about is naturally by Tinashe. I'm gonna talk about this briefly, but I like the song. It's a really dope, vibey song. It was like around Valentine's Day, so I thought it was gonna be like a love, love song, like a ballad, but it was like more of like a pop, soft R&B type song. It was a cool little song. It's in the mix. If you are a big fan of like same old mistakes by Rihanna or like James Joy by Rihanna that you're gonna like this song. It's really cool dope vibe. It's not something over the top. It's not like X by her or whatever. It is basically just a soft smooth going song. I don't understand why it was released as a single but you're an independent artist so I guess you just release the music when you feel like it and you know what I feel you. But Briefly, I don't understand why Tanache is not an A-lister. I don't understand why she's not in the likes of like a like a Rihanna and all of that others. I don't understand why she's not at that level. I don't know why light-skinned is not light-skinned enough for her. And I'm not saying the only thing that she has is benefit of being light-skinned, but she's actually really talented. I've seen her live. She does a dope performance. She sings and dances. She sings live and dances full out, and she does not lose breath and huff and puff like some of y'all other favorite rapper. But I'm saying like she's dope, and I don't understand why she's not further just off of talent alone. But especially because she light-skinned. Light-skinned people we usually can make it pass without having to do much of anything. I'm gonna sit here like, bitch, you got everything working for you, but everything is working against you. But I guess it's because she's independent now. And I don't know if there's an issue where people are trying to halt, stunt her growth. But you know what, Tanache? We love you over here at the Hashtag Diva Gang Podcast. Keep doing your thing. Um, The next thing I wanted to discuss is... Akeem Ali's Do Em All Dirty Dead D-E-A-D album. First of all, I love this album. My favorite song is 1111, Water, um, Indian Giver, Spin It, and I like Peach Fanta as well. I think you did an excellent job on this body of work. I honestly, first of all, you are so fine to me. Akeem Ali, if you ever see this, if you want to holler at me, I am at Deja underscore Diva on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, just get at me. I know you be running in the Houston rap circle, so don't act like you can't find me. I will be wherever you are, honey bunch of oats. I love this album. First of all, the 1111 song with Davion, um, I don't know how to say the name properly, but um, that song is really going up on TikTok. I really, really love that song. I love it so much. I think you are extremely talented. He's from Mississippi. He is extremely punchline, 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 punchline. And I love a punchline rapper, but he also has a good flow and he has a diverse range of music. I was getting a little nervous because you do the Akeem Ali like 
Kimi Casanova character and I was hoping I was like God please don't let him get trapped in this character of himself I want people to see Akeem and not Kimi all the time and um the, his first project was Roland and I love that one as well but he's tra but then his EP was the Kimi Casanova EP and I love that as well my favorite song on there is the Mac and um but I really like the fact that you close out this air, this chapter, this 2021 chapter, with a body of work on your own. Indian Giver is a really, really hype song. Spin It, I love the interlude where it's like, Skrr! and then you come back and you just rap, 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 bar after bar after bar. The intro is fire. Peach Fanta is amazing. Um, Rolling Your Body. First of all, you say Rolling in almost every song. I think that's like kind of like your signature. Um, and I love that. Big Crit, getting him on the, your first project. Well, it's not your first project. Your second and a half project is like amazing. Um, Walk It Like I Talk It. I like that song as well. That song is two songs in one. We Don't Roll and Walk It Like I Talk It. Um, 11 Eleven is a very smooth sound. Her voice is just so ethereal. Like, I love her tone she did such a good job on this song and the other song but we'll get back to that later heartbreaker it's like the album kind of started off high then it transitioned into some lows and then it came back up i really like water i love the the verse on that song i like the like the water drop sound in the background with the beat i think it's amazing the Do Em All Dirty uh, title song is amazing. Is You Mad? I like that song a lot. I like that song a little bit more after I gave this album like a fifth listen. And I'm just saying like this whole project was amazing. I want to see a few more visuals for the project. I would love to see a visual for Spin It. I would love to see a visual for Water. And I would love to see a, ver a video for, um, for Walk It Like I Talk It. I would love to see a video for that. I really think that you are a very, I think he's very underrated. I think that he doesn't, people don't give him enough press. And I don't understand why, because you are extremely talented. I um, I don't know where you have to go to get the press, because I don't think you really make TikTok dance music. You make music that people can vibe to and people can relate to. You have a, you have the fuck these bitches music. You have the jumping in the club music. You have the the 70s type feel. You have the R&B type feel, the love feel, the uh, the alternative type feel. But you also have like Lil Wayne punchline, punchline, punchline type deal. You are putting Mississippi on the map. I really, really like that because it's not a lot of rappers that be coming. Like, there's a lot of rappers in Mississippi and from Mississippi, but coming out, not that many that I can think of off the top. I really, really dig your vibe. Your freestyles are insane on the radio shows. I really, really like you, Akeem. I do, and I think you are so cute. Uh, <laughs> but I digress. The next thing I wanted to talk about is Vain Glory. It's an EP by this girl named Amai. That's A-M-A-I. It is called Vain Glory. V-A-I-N Glory. And it's amazing. Um, it's If you like Same Old Mistakes by Rihanna, or if you like alternative type indie rock music, this is the album for you. Uh, her, the, the instrumentals on this album were amazing. I really loved the instrumentation on this entire project. I think that whoever produced it needs to get their dick sucked immediately, or their ass eaten, or their vagina eaten, because they did a great job. I, you have the first song called Bane with Chia. And Chia is one of the people that she does her podcast with. I think that y'all should check that out. And um, I, everything about these artists, all the artists' music and stuff will be linked below. My favorite song on this whole project is Down uh, featuring Ergo and Bria. Twenties featuring Hallie Monet and Legacy. This is a five song EP, but it's 19 minutes. And the songs are long. And I think I appreciate that because I'm always complaining about song length because I feel like nowadays people are making really, 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 really short 
fucking songs and it really kind of irks my soul because I feel like people are doing that just so they can have more entries on billboards or have more opportunities to win awards. I think it's a very political thing and I appreciate that you actually have songs that you can have a high, a low, a beginning, middle, or end to. I think that the songs are super vibey. Um, it's a different style and energy of music. I know I listen on this platform to mostly hip hop and high energy pop and R&B and like old school R&B, but for me, I like black music all over the place. Like I just, I reviewed Willow's album on my, on a couple podcasts ago. I like all types of music. I can get my brain into the thought of what type of music and energy I am listening to and then I can critique from there. I don't say, I don't try to judge a fish by how good it can climb a tree. I am giving a hip hop song a completely different grade of judgment than I'm giving a pop song. It's like a completely different class to me. Like it's science, it's math, it's, it's gym class. And for me, I think that when I, I know that I have a great ear for music, but I also know that music is subjective. I have my personal opinions. I never say that something is bad. I never say that it's trash. I say I don't like it. I say what I feel. And personally, I love alternative music, but you have to be a real, real, like ethereal, lyrical, good production as artists for me to like it because alternative music can skew on the side of boring real fast, real fast. And for me, that's not what this project did. I think that the project is a smooth listen through. It's tra the transitions are really, really good. Shout out to Amai. I kind of, I, I founded her on Twitter when they said, if you are a black queer artist, please retweet or reply. And I saw her as the first one and I was like, let me check it out to see if it's worth something. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna actually review this chick on my podcast. I'm here for it. Okay. Now, the last topic on today's podcast. I'm so happy to be back with you guys. I wanted to say this for the end because I have opinions. The Super Bowl. Having Mickey Guyton do the national anthem was a decent choice. Having... Mary Mary do the Black National Anthem was a decent choice. Having Janae Aiko do America the Beautiful, decent choice. The lineup, the Compton and the Seawalk and all of this, the kneeling and all of that was cute or whatever. But I think that everything that happened at the Super Bowl was just a decent choice. It didn't move me. It didn't make me feel any type of way. I'm not easily influenced by symbols of progress and that's why I was really like okay I was really indifferent about Jay-Z joining forces with NFL because I don't know if the NFL is actually looking forward to actually implementing the change that Colin Kaepernick was kneeling for or just implementing a black place face in a high space to make everybody shut the fuck up I am not a fan of performative activism. And that's why when Jay-Z asked, what was Colin Kaepernick kneeling for in that meeting? And none of you niggas answered, I already knew why y'all asked him to come. Colin Kaepernick was not kneeling so that you could have more black people perform at the Super Bowl. He was kneeling for the injustice that black people face outside of the walls of the stadiums in the streets with the police. He was also kneeling in part because of the way that black players are treated under sports um, institutions. He was kneeling for a lot of different things that affect black people's everyday life. Black people have always performed at Super Bowls. Whether it was the national anthem or the the halftime show. That, my friends, does nothing for the Tamir Rices, the Atatiana Jeffersons, the Corin Gaineses, the Sandra Blands, the George Floyds, the Breonna Taylors, the Philando Castiles, the Michael Browns, the Trayvon Martins of the world. It does nothing. 
It's just a performative symbol of false pseudo freedom. And let me explain to you guys why I was not impressed. The performance in and of itself was wonderful. I think that they should have increased 50 Cent's microphone a little bit. But Mary J. Blige, when she fell out, I lived. I gagged. I had my life. I love the fact that Dr. Dre brought all of his artists out. It was a very, very cool thing to see. The energy started off high and it closed beautifully. When Eminem, when they heard that Lose Yourself beat, they lost themselves. Truthfully and honestly, and my favorite person of the night was Kendrick Lamar. I noticed that they took out that, I'm, uh, and we hate Popo. They want to kill us dead in the streets for sure. I noticed they took that line out. And it was great. It was a great show. That's the extent. It was an amazing show. It's actually one of the best halftime performances of all time. But let's not get crazy. We had Beyonce and Bruno Mars. We had Beyonce on her own. We had Michael Jackson. We had Prince. We're going to calm down. But <laughs> it was one of my favorite halftime performances. Um, and that's all I have to say on that. I'm not moved as a blackity black black on this Black History Month. This Black History Month has low be keeping garbage because I, I, I was trying to do my videos, but I have been all over the fucking place, all over this damn city. I'll talk about that later on Patreon. But subscribe, by the way, $5, 10 15 or $25 a month for exclusive behind the scenes access, promo codes on future merch and shows. Whole bunch of shit. But everybody did great. Janae sounded amazing. She was in a good pocket. She wasn't wailing or whatever. She's not that type of singer. And I can and I judge her vocals based off of what kind of vocalist she is. And she was really, really warm and in there. But I was just... I didn't feel empowered, but I enjoyed the show. That's where I'm going to leave it. And I was going to try not to say this, but I'm going to just say this. And if you know, you know. I think it's funny how Monique really didn't do much of anything wrong and we were we're always quick to throw a black woman under the, under the bus. Oh, you didn't wear leggings with your dress? Cancel. That's the only time cancel culture went, uh, works is when black women are involved for doing something that you didn't like as opposed to doing something that was fucked up. Oh, you didn't wear a bra? Cancel. Black woman, you black bitch, you. But black men can do whatever the fuck they want to do and still be able to perform at the Super Bowl. And that's all I have to say with that. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for checking out this podcast and bye divas. What you say? Uh. <laughs> yeah. It's Deja Diva. Uh. Yo. Cause your man be leaving my back bro He not Kendrick Lamar But he call me swimming pool So uh, he can practice his back uh, All of you bitches is flat broke I'ma give them what they ask for Hoes acting froggy like tadpoles I'm in the cut like a scaffold Rap got so come and visit the chapel Put it in that nigga face Now he addicted I call him KFC Cause he say his finger licking Yeah I keep him wired up like electricians I'm all up in his mouth But I never been a dentist All y'all whack rap niggas Needed some assistance I fire all these niggas Like celebrity apprentice Got good brain Like that nigga with the prince And I blew that nigga top I ain't talking Mark Simpson Why he doing all that for the D Cause I choose them to Yeah, I put that round to your body like a hula hoop uh, I'm giving very much diva Your girl gives a boom of food I leave you square Niggas twist it like a Rubik's Cube Confusing who? These your diva next up out of Houston, bitch Go ahead and adjust cause you bitches